welcome back for for the umpteen time today. I'm sure everyone's tired of seeing me up here. Um, only half kidding. Um, but listen, welcome back. This is going to be the keynote speech uh, for myself. And, you know, I figured what's the main thing we should focus on here? Um, you know, we get a lot of questions from our consulting, our advisory arm, a lot of similar questions, a lot of similar challenges we see from the industry as a whole. So I figured, you know, let's take this half hour upcoming uh, to really dive into some of that that we're seeing. So I'm sure everyone can see the little presentation on the screen right now. A little about me, uh, Peter Gaffney, head of research at Security Token Advisors. That's our consulting, our advisory arm. We put out a lot of research. That's how kind of a lot of our asset management and infrastructure clients find us. In fact, you know, we are an independent third party, not a brand, not a bank, not a broker, not a law firm. We are simply an independent group here. And so we've worked with a number of different clients, um, you know, 40 plus to date across real estate, carbon credits, fine art, uh, global asset managers, index providers, uh, commercial banks, and kind of anything in between. So that's a little about us. I guess I could have moved it right there. Um, but, you know, we're we're pretty deep entrenched on the research side, the consulting advisory side, the white touch side. And Herbig and I actually covered earlier today the success network that we have, the whole research consortium where we aggregate a lot of the industry all in one place. So plenty of different options. If anyone wants to get in touch with us uh, later on, feel free to do so. And so I would like to kick it off really uh, looking at the market landscape here. And so when I, you know, when people talk about, you know, I have Peter, STA. How big is the tokenization market? I see a lot of reports um, listing it as like, you know, $650 million right now. I've seen $800 million. I've seen, you know, a billion. Of course, everyone sees the estimates up to 10, 16, 30 trillion, whatever it may be. Uh, a lot of people really don't realize that there's a couple of different there's a few different facets that go into that overall market size. And so we track a lot of the secondary trading data at security token market, stm.co. And that actually peaked at $20 billion in listed assets. And that was uh, probably this time last year, maybe it was like May 2022, I think. Um, but $20 billion. And right now it's actually sitting around $17 billion all in. And that's across, you know, private equities, pre-IPO shares, real estate, um, certain commodities, uh, and, you know, globally all on secondary listed exchanges and marketplaces. But really, that's just the tip of the iceberg. So that's just the very tip what's actively trading right now. We know there's so much more beyond that that either could be tokenized. That's the furthest cohort that's on digital rails, working with like on-chain fund admins, on-chain management platforms, um, even like, you know, API, uh, just digital interfaces that are now connecting to blockchain because now you're on the digital rails and soon you could flick a switch and you could be you could be tokenized essentially. Not that not quite that easy, but, you know, that's how we'll talk about it here. Um, and then even closer to that home run area is where you're actually actively issuing products through a broker dealer, looking to raise capital in the primary issuance phase. Maybe you're working with a Goldman Sachs or a JPM or a Jefferies, and you're actually, um, you know, looking basically having them underwrite deals. Maybe you're you're working with just on chain uh, parties and, and actually issuing new products on chain, like we see a lot, and we'll cover a bunch in, in just a few minutes. Um, but that all contributes to the overall market size. And really, I would put that around $95 billion. Just, and that's based on what we see from some of the industry platforms, from some of their assets, from what we hear uh, behind closed doors from our own clients and, our, and just some industry partners that we talk to. And again, that's the whole collective area, the whole collective market. And then you also have repos. So it's not really an investable product, but rather we're seeing all these banks, we're seeing JPM, we're seeing Broadridge, we're seeing recently um, even UBS tokenizing money market funds, you know, HQLAX, different platforms that are tokenizing uh, high quality liquid assets for repo transactions, for collateral mobility. Um, and essentially, you know, that's not something that I'm going to go invest in, but rather it's what the banks and the parties are making use of. Total volume on that is is beyond eight trillion dollars. You could really thank J.P. Morgan and Broadridge for that number right there, which is tremendous in, in my opinion, and something going way under the radar. And the other um, kind of collage, if you will, of headlines here is really just what I like to use to kind of paint the picture of just really look at the firms that are entering the space and doing things tangibly. So not just from a retail offering a security token to raise capital perspective, but really from a whole holistic standpoint on the capital markets. Okay, here's a couple institutional platforms. Take a look. Look at all the familiar faces you see. Okay, and we're going to talk about these in a bit more depth soon. 
But like, look at Goldman Sachs with their GSDAP, Goldman Sachs Digital Asset Platform. They officially went live earlier in January this year, 2023. Been in the works for some time. They work with digital asset, DAMLs, programming language, um, basically a private blockchain solution. And they issue digital bonds. You know, we'll cover a bit more in depth later, but they're already seeing savings that are getting passed on to their own clients and to buyers. That's tangible progress. That's really what blockchain is for. Everybody loves touting efficiencies. And then you ask, hey, okay, where are the efficiencies? What are you seeing saved? Or what new, you know, what new assets are you really raising? This is something very tangible through GSDAP. You have Onyx. They just completed uh, BlackRock's first live tokenized money market uh, collateral push over to Barclays Bank. And that's something very tangible. And they've already, they're about to hit a trillion dollars in total repo uh, transaction volume in Onyx alone. Um, they actually had a keynote yesterday. Feel free to check that out in the recording section too on your own time. We have City a couple of weeks ago who issued City token services. They're basically tokenizing institutional client deposits to make use of them in a real time 24 seven nature. Again, think about treasury management, think about collateral management, collateral mobility. Uh, and they're even rolling that out to trade finance and shortening those periods from like five to seven days to just a couple hours on the uh, letter of credit side, which is how that whole industry operates. Two hours versus five days, that's a tremendous amount of manual labor, aka salaries and, and costs on that side, let alone any reconciliation errors that you're saving now just like that. HSBC, similar on the digital bond side, Broadridge, distributed ledger, repo, they're doing uh, literally a trillion dollars a month right now. I think it's like 30 to 40 billion a day in uh Distributed ledger tech based repos. They're working with SockGen. They're working with DRW, some very cool partners on there. Equiland, also on the securities lending side, rolled out their own. Uh, I believe it's called One Source. You know, it's uh, basically a one stop shop for securities lending in order to meet T plus one and eventually T plus zero requirements on securities lending and settlement. All funds works with the Lions Berenstein, huge asset manager on the fund admin side. That's another tremendous use, use case. Deutsche Bank with their digital asset management administration platform, basically digitizing funds and HQLAX with good backing from like Goldman JPM for pure collateral mobility standpoints. Very cool use cases, some similar, some different. Uh, but as you see, really covering the map in ways that I think most people don't think about when they think about tokenization. All right. And so. Let's dive into just a couple little tidbits that you know really catch my eye. And when I'm talking to an asset manager or a bank and they say, hey, Pete, what are you seeing in the market? What should I look at? I kind of have a theme down now for 2023. It's a very recurring, powerful, uh, you know, few bullet points that are, keep coming up. And so really, it's not just about the democratization of investment access. It's a very strong case, of course. It's how a lot of us, myself included, got into the space looking at, you know, fractional investment opportunities, lowering uh, investment minimums, really leveraging that whole side for the retail crowd, even for the lower level of credit crowd. Um, but that's just one very specific facet, port portfolio construction, if you will, <clears throat> really a lot of the initial savings a lot of the initial value adds of the technology are going to be seen on the back end for a lot of these big banks, for a lot of the blue chip firms, really just on the operational and infrastructure cases. And so I've kind of been coining this saying, I don't know if it's catching on, maybe you all could help me, um, but you got to save money before you can make money in the institutional side. You know, we have companies, we saw Wisdom Tree today, we saw Franklin Templeton today, rolling out Wisdom Tree Prime and Benji Investments, and they're actually raking in new AUM. And that's new AUM, assets under management for their new blockchain products that they could actually start charging fees on. And that's great. That's a whole revenue generation. That's a whole, whole new source of revenue beyond the typical business lines. I think that's awesome. Um, but I also think there's a lot, you know, we see a lot of hesitancy. Those are two very trailblazing firms. We see a lot of hesitancy from our own asset managers um, and some similar parties saying, you know, Peter, we, we like the technology. We see it. We could issue products manage that a bit more efficiently, but how are we going to actually get the buy-in to make this stuff happen? You know, we can't just issue a feeder fund and hope that's going to solve all our problems. It probably won't. Um, but to really roll out a whole suite of products, we need to see exactly what we're getting ourselves into. And so I've kind of seen it and we've been kind of doing a 180, you know, focus on the back and middle office upgrades. If you could reduce all the touch points between investor onboarding to actually securing money in a like a, so an initial subscription, um, that's tangible savings, much like the, the trade finance example I offered before. If you could reduce touch points from, you know, 30 to 40 touch points just to an, onboard an investor 
and bring them down to a couple uh, to, you know, five or 10, that's tremendous right there. And when you start seeing those savings, that's when you get the buy-in from the executive teams. It's so, okay, you guys are going to run with this for, for a year, two years, three years. And in the meantime, you'll be saving on that back end. We'll figure out how to commercialize it and scale upwards without scaling our headcount. That's a major key. And that's what will give them the freedom to then explore more product offerings, if you will. So that's kind of how I've been looking at it. And that's something that's been resonating with a lot of the asset managers. Similarly, looking at the industry itself, the players, we know there's a bunch of different, not a bunch, there's, yeah, there's a handful of different digital brokers, digital alternative trading systems or multilateral trading facilities or other recognized market operators, digital ex securities exchanges, um, all kind of on the startup side. But there's also a lot of incumbents now coming in, either upgrading their licensing or even just new firms, legacy firms with tremendous um, networks and kind of entrenchment announcing their intentions of blockchain powered marketplaces, exchanges, solutions, and whatnot. And that's very powerful because eventually these will all interconnect um, and you'll start to see real market aggregation on the primary and secondary side, which would solve a lot of the problems that we're going to look at too. And lastly, something just think about this, you know, why money markets and treasuries? Why is this the one that's now suddenly catching on? Why is this cohort catching on? And we talked about it in a couple of different panels, but we'll look again uh, very shortly. So looking at some active samples here, um, these kind of more or less line up with what we covered on the previous slide. You know, not just about investment access. Look at JPM. They're about to hit a trillion dollars in collective blockchain-based repo transactions and their, their tokenized collateral network transactions. Let's put those in the same cohort now. They're expecting $20 million of projected savings on 2023 transactions alone, which was actually less than a trillion dollars collectively. And so that percentage piece is uh, is what it's like uh, 0.0015 bips. It's super small in the grand scheme of things. Um, but when you roll it out at scale, I mean, a trillion dollars in yearly uh, volume, the normal repo market does two to $3 trillion a day as is. So when you start scaling this up, that's meaningful savings. You can't scoff at that. And if you're on an innovation team at a bank, uh, at a either a sell side or a buy side firm, you can't ignore that because then you're not doing your job. So that's great precedent right there. Even Societe Generale is part of uh, Broadridge's distributed ledger repo platform, DLR. And they're seeing $100,000 in savings for every 1 million repo transactions. I can't say how often SockGen is partaking in these transactions. So I don't know how long that million really um, you know lapses time-wise, but at least we have some tangible mark to kind of keep an eye on uh, in that regard. And now think about what I said before, when you're talking about license upgrades and new entrants or legacy entrants, you have OTC Markets Group. Uh, Cass had an, an amazing panel yesterday on the liquidity side where she mentioned they have that inter-dealer quotation system where they could actually plug in with a bunch of different brokers. Instead of going investor to investor and routing orders that way, they're going broker to broker. So these brokers are aggregating their own orders, flowing through OTC markets and finding other brokers, basically acting as market makers on that front. That's extremely powerful. We want to bring liquidity to this market, which is what everyone touts eventually. Um, that's definitely a necessary component. And we even saw, you know, Castle Placement uh, went live with their ATS that now supports digital asset securities, just like OTC Markets Group upgraded their licensing, digital asset securities. And most recently, back in September this year, just last month, London Stock Exchange Group announced its intention of a blockchain-powered exchange, kind of exploring, you know, more or less the, the global cross-border trading and how that could complement their existing business. I mean, they have some of the deepest, deepest ties in the entire capital market system. You know, you cannot ignore that. And if you're a smaller broker, you know, maybe find a way to play with them, find a way to get on, to get kind of involved with what they're doing. And they'll help aggregate a bunch of volume, and that'll be um, to the benefit of the entire industry. Lastly, I talked a bit earlier, a couple of slides ago, about the total market size and that people keep kind of falling on that $650 million mark. That's only money market and treasury assets on chain. And that's a great piece because a lot of the narratives lately are, okay, if rates, if the risk-free rate is upwards of 5% these days in treasuries, you know, how can I possibly park my client's money $300 million of client capital into a stable coin generating nothing. Or worse, 
maybe gen, maybe we're generating something, but you know, in, in not so professional ways or um, just with higher risk profiles. And so that's become kind of a non-starter for a lot of them. And so seeing these on-chain money markets or treasury funds at the rate levels that we are, it's kind of a no-brainer. Rotate out of stables and into these products. I think that will continue because eventually you'll have these end-to-end -end digital systems. And to really capture all the efficiencies we love talking about, you can't, you're not going to capture any meaningful savings if every time you're swapping out of a an on-chain private equity fund, for example, you're going back into fiat or, oh, I got to go buy uh, my off-chain treasury product with my existing broker. Bringing all that on-chain creates that end-to-end -end digital ecosystem, lets you stay right there. And whenever you're in between investments, you just park your capital right in that treasury asset on-chain and you're collecting 5% or whatever the rate may be. So that's a very big value prop there. And that's why you're seeing a lot of different flows into these types of products. All right, what are institutions evaluating? So the institutional playbook from us, <clears throat> you know, forget about the widespread product offerings for now. You know, people commonly look at, let's say the ATSs, they see the same offerings or the same listings they've seen for the past couple of years. They see volumes kind of weak, but forget about that right now. It's not always about the product. Like I said, um, you know, things you, you could issue a product, but if things aren't plugging into your back end or your existing operations as a big firm, it's going to be tough to scale anyway. So for a one and done, that's fine. But if you're really looking to commercialize something and issue a whole eventual suite of on-chain products or similar initiatives, you're going to look at your back and middle offices first. Okay. And that's something big. And that's something uh, we just had Pat O'Meara, CEO of Invenium on here, um, his whole company. That's the basis, right? Digitizing that back and middle office, allowing fund admins, accountants, tax assessors, investment bankers, um, you know, uh, commercial real estate appraisers, anyone, valuation agents to kind of plug in and get permission into a shared database and offer up all the necessary documents. And that's how you streamline your back and middle offices. You're no longer reconciling among five different parties, waiting uh, five, waiting 15 or even 30 days for documents to come your way. You're getting them in real time. The limitation is still that human component as fast as they can get it physically done. But as soon as it's done, it's stamped on chain and you're there. OK, something also that's very cool looking at from the institutional side, investment banks are getting involved in this type of stuff. We had the um, mentioned earlier even with Anthony Morris, CEO of Providence, um, talking about the Providence blockchain based HELOC offering got rated by Morningstar, first of its kind. Underwritten by Jeffries, JP Morgan, and Goldman Sachs. Jeffries was involved three years ago in 2020, and now they're back in the game. An extremely strong sign from a, a very solid firm, I would say. Um, and this is something that investment banks can do. They should just be taking on tokenized deals and figuring out how the tech really affects them. In Goldman's case, for example, like I said, they passed 15 basis points through. And what they saved on the tech side, on the back office management side, they passed it through to Union Investment Group, which was the primary buyer of that bond. I think it was a hundred million euro bond. I think they probably saved just under two hundred thousand dollars on that. Um, but that's excess capital that flows their way. Again, that was a single offering at scale. That's nothing to scoff at, and that's some serious business. Okay. And lastly, I already touched on this part, but where do we park client money in digital systems? Probably not stables, maybe stables, but really money markets, treasuries, on-chain deposits. We see all the banks doing it. They're doing it for a reason. All right. And uh, as I'm going through, feel free to, you know, any questions, try to type in the chat and we'll address them as we can. So a couple of things that get affected. Again, this is really institutional focus. Still, retail is not going to be looking at repos, um, but that's okay. We'll get we'll get to them shortly. So repo transactions underpinned by DLT and tokenized high quality liquid assets, HQLA. There's a platform named after it, HQLAX. But really looking at, at the money markets, looking at the treasury products, looking at uh, cash equivalents, looking at kind of anything that's in that realm, in that cohort of products is what's going to be the Trojan horse to kind of get institutions familiar uh, and back offices, middle offices, and even their counterparties who could be trading firms, uh, buy side firms, other sell side groups, getting them comfortable with the technology. I mean, even if you want to look at it from a regulatory standpoint, the SEC is expecting T plus one settlement time on securities transactions by May 24th. And, you know, even at the Equiland, I have a screenshot here in the bottom right. 
they uh, they're a service that does security fintech focus on securities lending. They have one source, the name of their DLT ledger now, to permission all of their major parties in because they simply don't think uh, T plus one will be achieved when you're reconciling between five different parties all the time. Like you're just going to be at the mercy of any one of the other parties' staff and and their speed pretty much. So T plus zero is out of the question without something like this. So I'm extremely bullish on that side. I think this is where a lot of efficiencies are going to be found when you look at securities lending at scale. Again, the repo will be the Trojan horse that gets people comfortable and they start seeing, okay, this is how the technology is being used. Um, and then look at that from other business applications, trade finance, a great example, securities lending. And beyond that, we'll start to see what happens in the alternative space. In general, like, you know, I'm thinking as firms get comfortable with the money markets and treasuries, eventually they'll be digitizing their own real estate holdings. I'm not even talking, you know, security token offering real estate projects, but rather their own holdings, whether it's their own funds, their own um, direct commercial properties of extreme value, hundreds of millions, billion dollars each. And they'll be making use of that, maybe not in repo systems, but in different lending platforms with each other, with major um, federal counterparties and anything kind of in between. So that's something to keep an eye on. And also eventually this will affect new portfolio construction, just a whole new world of precision that could kind of come to this, uh, well, the, to the whole capital markets. Right now, I keep talking about the repo stuff. I'm sure everyone's tired of hearing about it. I think it's very cool. It's a very uh, bare bones type of focus, which is why it's you know kind of unique that it, we find so much excitement in it. It's because look at how it's typically done. A repurposed transaction, you typically have two counterparties, and they're both negotiating for the better deal for their firm. And so, in J.P. Morgan, Onyx is first, not first, but first repo transaction with Goldman Sachs. Shared ledger. Each side saw exactly how the transaction happened, how long it took from initiation, mid ground to you know return of capital of the asset and completion. Three hours and five minutes precisely. No room for negotiation. No room for back and forth. You know we didn't have one party saying it was three and a half hours. We didn't have the other party saying two and a half. Um, and on this specific trade, there were um, interest was accruing by the minute. So to know that it's three minutes and five seconds versus I'm sorry, three hours and five minutes versus three hours and 30 minutes is a huge difference when you're looking at interest that way. And think about that applied to so many other different facets that are kind of like repos, but with different assets, just anything in the collateral mobility um, realm and think about it like that. And that's where you really start to see, wow, this is powerful. This reduces any error. This reduces my, if my team is, you know, struggling to get the better deals on that side, you know, if we're getting kind of strong arm from certain partners that just may be bigger um, and kind of more powerful in this specific realm, um, that's where you really start to see a lot of these benefits and boom, becomes automated. And again, this is going to be the Trojan horse. You're looking at other types of things, tailwinds from regulation themselves. We mentioned the SEC, T plus one and private fund reporting. You got APRA over in Australia mandating better private asset reporting. And there's a lot happening there with their banks, with their asset managers and their service providers. Um, you have Vanguard working with DLT over there to streamline their own operations. And then you have SEBI in India looking at blockchain for covenant testing in the fixed income and lending space. All very cool stuff. And when you think about it from a you know, kind of a deeper level, like how are we going to achieve all of this? It's going to simply be through uh, blockchain, through distributed ledger tech, and more specifically through tokenization. Okay, a couple, just to take a look uh, at some of the blockchain dominance so far in tokenization. Keep in mind, we had the blockchain panel yesterday, um, no particular order here, and there's plenty of names that are active in the space. And these just happen to stand out to me pretty heavily. Providence blockchain, we see what they're, they're doing on the HELOC side, on the asset-backed security side, and eventually on the private fund side, big companies like Apollo. Um, they already account for 6 to 7% of the entire, not blockchain-based HELOC, but the entire HELOC home equity line of credit market as is, which is remarkable, thinking about how early this space is and how much they're already capturing on that. We have Polygon issuing a lot on the private credit side. 
gaining a lot of traction from existing issuers who are now doubling down and kind of expanding their net to Polygon. Franklin Templeton is a great example. Um, and then, you know, even companies that are just issuing digital bonds like ABN AMRO with Polygon. Um, I'm sorry, that was stellar, but Polygon still has its own, you know, kind of footprint within the ecosystem as an Ethereum layer too. And we're seeing a lot more flow that way. R3 is actually a private solution, Corda specifically developed by R3. They're EVM compatible now too, which is very cool because now we're seeing the flow from private blockchain solutions to you know public solutions, which is, of course, one of the great debates in the industry right now. I talked about that in my opening remarks earlier today. Avalanche, another EVM compatible chain, and they're doing some great work. Avalanche Vista, $50 million fund to deploy towards tokenized assets on Avalanche. They have uh, the Spruce subnet for institutions to actually come play around and get familiar. Wisdom Tree's in on that. Uh, Wellington, Tiro Price, um, so all extremely cool stuff. And, and what they're building uh, within the Spruce subnet can then be rolled out to the, the main net on Avalanche, which is huge. Chainlink perhaps having the best Q3 I've seen. I mean, with their cross-chain interoperable interoperability protocol, basically bridging the gap, bridging all these different chains and assets um, with Chainlink specifically alongside Swift, DTCC, some major parties, Keep an eye on Chainlink and their tangible progress coming out. Digital asset, like I mentioned, with Goldman Sachs, with Broadridge, they're just they're one of the most institutional focused and successful so far companies. Um, really like the use cases we're seeing out of that on the digital bond side, especially Hyperledger. Uh, we had on yesterday as well. A lot happening, especially in Singapore. Look at Bond Blocks doing digital bonds, distributing through Citigroup as the digital custodian. That's a huge marquee case that's kind of under the radar. Stellar, as I mentioned, they're already working with Franklin Templeton, ABN AMRO, uh, Block Time Financial, one of our sponsors of the Tokenizes Conference. And they, of course, have built a nice name for themselves. Lastly, Coinbase's base, who's really taken on a little, well, they have potential to take on a large share of the market, and they're really making a splash right away. Um, definitely keep an eye on them and their integrations as things kind of move further on chain. Okay, I have a couple minutes left here. I see. Uh, I'm going to check out. So, the real question let's go to the retail side. Where are the buyers? Who's actually buying tokenized products? Um, and so, let's look at raising capital from retail is tough. So, brokers are still getting up to speed. They're still curating family offices and private banks for distribution. Like I just mentioned, City with Bond Blocks is a great example to just take a big firm and go direct to their wealthy client base. Securitize buying up on ramp invest to distribute like their Hamilton Lane and KKR products to the RIA channel, right? As alongside digital asset offerings, that's all great moves. We need to figure out how to connect to traditional investment banking channels, though, in the interim. That's definitely a necessity right now to really raise meaningful capital. I mentioned Providence and, and the blockchain based HELOCs, Franklin Templeton, 300 million in assets. That's nothing to scoff at. It's very impressive with their money market fund, Ondo Finance. Creeping up on Franklin to a certain extent, raising 180 million for their short-term U.S. government bond fund this year alone. They only came live in 2023, um, and then you know a couple of years ago on the retail level, INX, who we heard from yesterday, and Exodus raising 85 million and 75 million respectively a couple of years back. Looking at the secondary markets for anyone interested in the trading side, like I said, it's about six, at the time of this, it was like 16 billion. The market cap on secondaries right now is like 17 and a half. Trading volumes are still extremely low. The real question is, should these assets trade at all? I mean, not at all, but should they trade heavily? If they're real estate assets, how much are they going to fluctuate? More so maybe start thinking of things like a bulletin board system um, and thinking, of, thinking about it as like liquidity if you need it, rather than if you're really actively sitting there trading, getting in and out of positions. Um, we're coming up on time, I see, but you know, for any more of our research and insights, we have our State of Security Tokens 2023 quarterly reports coming out. Q1 Extended was sponsored by Providence Blockchain. Q2 was sponsored by Coinbase. We have our RWA report basically covering 13 different blockchains and their use cases right at STM. Um, but you know, we'll be rolling out Q3 also, so keep an eye on that one. Very excited for that with our sponsor, and it'll it'll be huge. And and always kind of bringing that content out for anyone interested in talking to us. It's Peter at SecurityTokenAdvisors.com. Uh, but that's really all I have right now. Looking forward to the next panel and kind of wrapping this this up for day two. It's been an amazing day so far. Thank you everyone for listening in. Hope you found this all helpful.